that you were a wordsmith. <laughs> Call Jiggy right now. 267 22 Jiggy. Hey, Jiggy, what's happening, man? You must be that uh, David Bowie song. Jiggy Play Guitar. Jeff. It's a great name, man. Thanks so much for having me on the show. Presenting. I'm, I'm Mike Massey, and uh, you know, you can catch me on Jiggy Jag TV and uh, see a few of my tricks up there. Thank you very much. Jiggy Jaguar. I never knew what freedom was until I saw you lose yours. Hi everybody, this is the Jiggy Jaguar show. This is Roger Hill here at City with the Jiggy Jaguar. We've got a full house today. We've got on the panel, we've got IQ Al Rasumi, and we have Mr. Dan Perkins with us. And we have a young man, a patriot, that's running for president. Now, he's a young man, and he's running for president, and he's running as a progressive, but for the GOP. So, you know something? Sam, let's just go right to you and say hi to the folks and, and let them know what you're up to and, and what started all this. Absolutely. So first and foremost, thanks for having me on here. I appreciate it. And hello, everybody, if you're listening or watching. So why am I running for president? Why is this 34-year-old veteran running for president? It's because I want to serve my country. I enlisted because I wanted to serve my country. I didn't give a damn about the GI Bill. I still haven't used it. I probably won't. The thing is, if you want to serve your country and your active duty and your government shuts down in the midst of a war after you have just sent people overseas to fight in said war and they get hurt they get injured they god forbid die they die not knowing whether or not their country's going to come back from that and so when that happened in october of 2013 the government shut down due to whatever nonsense washington was playing on the, at the time i was like this this isn't me serving my country i cannot protect and defend my country like this so I knew I had to get into politics, and I transitioned from active duty to getting into politics. And the joke here, uh, as Roger, I'm sure, is going to jump into, is that I ran as a Democrat first. Um, I ran for state representative, and then later on I ran for chairman of the DNC party, the whole kit and caboodle. Because while I was running for office, I had no support, no resources. The party didn't have resources or support or volunteers in that rural community. And when I ran for DNC chair, I said, listen, guys. I, I get that you're a national party, and I get that I am literally stabbing the eye of the tiger right now. But at the end of the day, if we want to succeed as a party, if we want to succeed as a country with democracy, period, dot, we got to start supporting the layman, right? W this isn't ancient Rome where the patrician class is the only class that's allowed to run for office. The Constitution of these United States was written so that you and me can run for office and should run for office and serve our one or two terms and then go back home and do our jobs. And well, needless to say, I didn't win because the party didn't want to hear that. And that's what snowballed into uh, my career today where I am now running for the presidency. Samuel, do me a favor. You're young, you're lovely, you're a patriot. Don't run for the presidency. Be a congressman for God's sake. Step one and step two and step three. Running for the presidency knowing full well you're going to fail. Not because there's something wrong with you. As you said, no backup. But sure. you can be a congressman. If Ilhan Omar, a piece of garbage from Somalia, a traitor to America, can be congresswoman, how is it possible you cannot be? I can actually answer that question. I've ran for Congress. Uh, I've ran, um, I've pretty much ran for every office there is. And some, some of the times that I ran, I was actually offered support. Uh, they, the, a party approach was, hey, we will totally get your back with the money, the resources, the volunteers, the whole nine yards. And then they didn't follow through. And so the issue is not that I'm running seemingly frivolously or that I, I disagree at all. I, I would love to be in Congress, to be perfectly honest. I'd be happy with state representative. Um, the problem is citizens, people like you and me, people like everyone that's on this panel and everybody watching and listening, do not have access to the ballot. They do not have access to being heard. They do not have access to being seen. This is literally a rich man's game and it never was supposed to be that way. Ever since the uh, Supreme Court ruled that money is free speech, guess what happened? Money became free speech and those who didn't have money didn't have free speech anymore. And I'm not saying I'm, I'm destitute by any stretch of the imagination and I wasn't then either. I was unemployed at the time, but it's because I quit my job and I was living off of my savings. But at the end of the day, Right. That's what it takes for one of us to run a plebeian, if you will. And so to say 
reach lower because there is support there that's also patently false. Unless you're playing the game and you're brown nosing and you're willing to capitulate and sacrifice your ideals and your morals and your values, there is no moving forward as a regular citizen. That's the problem. There is no universal voter registration. There is no public option for uh, elections or campaigning. There is no ranked choice voting. There's nothing to facilitate a free, fair, public, open election. And that's fundamentally what I am fighting for. Yes. Would I love to win? Sure. Could I possibly win? Absolutely. If I got on the debate stage, you'd see really quickly why you should vote for me as opposed to the other clowns on there. But that's also besides the point. Citizens in general are going to be better than a career politician because citizens know what it's like to deal with the consequences of Washington, right? These politicians don't. They, they don't. They literally are above the law. They are literally not beholden to the laws that they themselves write and vote into office, into, into existence. We are. We have to deal with those ramifications. So any citizen, I don't give a damn if they're homeless. I don't give a damn if they're a stock boy, a grocer, uh, a preschool teacher. Any single citizen of these United States is infinitely more qualified to be in office than these career politicians or any given billionaire that's like, mm, you know what, I'd like to sell a book or elevate my status ever so slightly by running for office. It's infuriating. Sorry, that was a tangent. My no, I agree with you. No, I agree with you 100%, and I would love to support you financially and otherwise. I mean it, honestly, because this is the sound of a patriot. This Thank is you. the... This is the voice of a patriot. Look, I'm not an American citizen, but I tell you what, and Roger and Dan know, I'm more American than any American you can think of because I believe in the Constitution of the United States of America. I believe in the exceptionalism, and the reason you have exceptionalism is you have a Constitution. And do me a favor, never use the word democracy in America, for God's sake. Even <laughs> if you go to, especially when you go to politics, you have no democracy. You are a constitutional republic, and you are right. You have no justice system. You have no equality, none whatsoever. And America is going down the sewer faster than you can possibly imagine. I agree with you. I wish you the best. Dan? Well, I've got, I, I interviewed him last week for an hour and a half and, <laughs> and went over his platform, and, and I think we should probably talk a little bit about that. But let me, let me just... It says IQ brought up the Constitution. The Constitution says that, uh, I believe it says that a candidate for president must be a minimum of 35 years of age. And you said you're 34. Correct. When will you, when will you be 35? This year. Where? When? Uh, November 22nd, which will be just in time for Inauguration Day. I have timed it on purpose to be that okay. nitty gritty. I would be the youngest president ever and realistically, probably the only young president of that age possible. <laughs> okay. Uh, he has four areas of, of his platform. Uh, one of them is my migration, one is income and taxes, the other is the police, hmm. and the uh, fourth is generally education. Let's, let's start with philosophically what he wants to do <laughs> is... Uh, bring a central control of to benefits, pay, seniority, privileges for all police in the country. And that means sheriffs, marshals, police officers, whatever, uh, all come under a set of standards established by the central government. So we're bringing the central government in control of the operation, budgets, training, of uh, police throughout the country. And I raised the question when I spoke with him last week, mm -hmm. if, if a city gets in trouble, where does the mayor go if there's a bureaucracy that's, that's training and dealing with the leadership issues of the police? Where does she go if she needs help? So I, as we spoke uh, last time, I, I'm glad you brought it up. So. What I want is national standardization of law enforcement, as, as you so eloquently put. And to the end of, there's already standardization across the board in healthcare, education, numerous other fields of our uh, social programs and uh, initiatives across the country at the local, state, and county levels. 
And each and every single one of them must adhere to certain federal minimum standards if they want the federal dollars. And that's what I am trying to uh, convey in my in my policy that standard to what the qualifications even are. Right. Whether we're talking drug testing, whether we're talking degrees, whether we're talking financial background checks, just like regular citizens deal with in their jobs. And then how long that training should be, considering in most states it takes longer to become a barber than it does to become an officer with historically uh, the word of law. Uh, so we don't even have a clear definition of what is and isn't a lawful order. If an officer thinks that what they are saying is legal, it has been upheld at various state levels to be factual, even if there is no law to justify the action of the officer, which to me seems extrajudicial. I mean, at this point, we may as well just call it Judge Dredd, give him a gun and a license to kill and call it a day. And quite frankly, that is what's happening to a lot of citizens who do not look uh, like you or me. Um, and, and this police brutality, this lack of trust, this outrage, this fear, this just in general, anxiety towards police could literally be resolved with a snap of the fingers by saying, no, this is what's a lawful order, this is the limitations of what a lawful officer can do, and this is how you're supposed to conduct yourself. Because even state to state, officer to officer, you get pulled over for just a regular speeding ticket. Uh, some states are supposed to get out of your car. Other states are supposed to stay in your car. Some states, the officer will tell you to get out of your car, but you're from a state where you're like, no, I'd rather stay in my car, and now he's pulling his gun, get out of the vehicle. You know, well, if, if we have a standard to prevent these things and where everybody's on the same page, it, I think it only improves. Just like any military police personnel, regardless of branch, in the DOD must fall under the same standards and the same practices. It, it, it's just that kind of mentality. But you know, it's a standard would be if we just do what the police officers ask us to do. Sure. Uh, I, I I never th thought for a moment of disobeying a police officer when pulled over. Nobody likes to get, nobody enjoys the feeling of seeing the lights behind them and go. Rrr. Nobody likes that. But but you know when it happens, uh, instead of blaming the police, why don't why don't people just follow what they're supposed to do. I mean, it, it takes two to tango. And uh, I, I think a lot of this fear of the police, frankly, is ginned up. None of this has to be. But a lot of it is, is stoked up. These fears are stoked. And look, these guys aren't making six figures. I don't think. And they're going out with targets oh. on their back every day. They really don't need this. So why, why isn't it that the public is not also responsible to, hey, do what the officer's asking you to do? It's not that hard. And I brought that up. Uh, it's so if we all know what to expect from an officer and an officer knows what to expect from a citizen, we don't have to worry about de-escalation. We don't have to worry about escalation. We don't have to worry about, oh, shucks, uh, this officer is pulling me over. OK, this is what I got to do. This is how I got to do it. Um, yes, sir. No, sir. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. Right. I'm not saying this standard is going to make it so people can just you know, disregard law enforcement, right? And that's not the point. The point is when an officer is engaging with the public currently, the training, the way officers are currently trained, and the reason why there is such concern is they see everyone, everything, every encounter, every engagement as a threat and to be treated as a threat rather than as a civil engagement, which is the question of what role do we truly want law enforcement in our society to play, that of enforcer or that of support? And if we're going to talk about support, then what elements of support are they actually engaging in? Do, does uh, an officer engaging in traffic control need to be armed with a shotgun, a pistol, a rifle, uh, body armor, and all sorts of other stuff just to hand out a speaking ticket? No. We have proof of that in the big cities. They're called meter maids. <laughs> you don't need to pay an officer and train them to, to fight and do this, that, and the other just to get out speeding tickets. So we can partition this role away from law enforcement and assign it some other title and, and other institution and call it that. Do we need law enforcement officers who have not been trained in dealing with mental health crises showing up with <laughs> to, to a person who's suicidal with a gun screaming at them to get on the ground, put down the weapon, get on the ground, put down the weapon when they are already suicidal? No, they are not crisis management. So why are law enforcement officers bearing that burden? Let's partition that resource and put it towards an actual, you know, 
thing, institution, that is actually trained and, and, and supposed to handle that kind of thing. And the list goes on. Law enforcement is meant to deter crime, enforce laws, and, and you know, deal with disputes and such, and investigate crimes, and investigate criminal activity, and then, of course, uh, engage in arrests and arresting activities. So the vast majority that cops do engage in is not that. And it does prevent them from doing their jobs. Like, for instance, rape kits. There's over 400,000 rape kits that go unchecked every single year. And that's because they're too busy doing everything else under the sun. And my point of standardization is we as a society establish this, shall we say, social contract of what we want to define as policing in America, define it accordingly, train it accordingly, and then everything else gets partitioned. Those extra funds, those extra budgets get set aside to doing what they actually can do, which is resolve other issues. And now all of a sudden we do have social safety nets that don't result that don't revolve around handouts and bailout monies and this that and the other it's actual crisis response it's actual whatever whatever responses rather than an officer dealing with every situation as if it's a nail when more often than not it's not so so let me let me follow that um new york city last year lost 250 police officers who retired or resigned a month over 3000 in California, Roger, some some municipalities are offering a base of $100,000 for an entry-level policeman and a $75,000 sign-on bonus. So an entry-level non-experienced patrolman can make $175,000, not counting overtime, his first year, and they can't fill the jobs. We had the situation recently where a, an illegal alien was released, attacked two policemen, beat them up, he was taken into custody and not charged and released. How do you convince the police that they want to do the job? And on top of that, how do you convince the American people that they should trust the police? So... Again, and I, I, I know this is going to sound repetitive or like I'm disregarding what you're saying. Trust is built on knowledge, right? If you don't know me, you trust me on the simple basis of respect. Until I give you a reason not to trust me, you're going to be like, all right, I mean, he's a guy, he's there, he's, he doesn't look like a scumbag, so I'm going to assume he's not a scumbag, right? Well, with law enforcement officers, they're wearing a badge, they have a uniform, they're all spiffy, they have their gun, they have their accoutrement, they're basically Batman, right? You expect Batman levels of interaction with them, and that's not always what you get, because there is no standardization. So it goes back to when people lose trust, and, and this happens at the corporate level too, so let me be very clear here. Corporations will raise prices, 1%. 1%, $1, 1%, 1 penny, 10 cents. And there's a breaking point of when the consumer, their, their loyal consumer, I'm talking dire, I'm talking like Pokemon fans and Taylor Swift fans and this level of just almost zealotry cult-like mentality of support for this corporation. They'll keep raising the thing, lowering the quality, raising the money, lowering the quality, and eventually it hits a breaking point to where that trust is irrevocably broken and cannot be regained through PR stunts or lowering the prices back down to normal or improving the quality. It's just gone because it, uh, it's, I think it's the law of erosion or something like that. And what we are currently facing, and, and, and maybe it's a generational thing, maybe it's an ideological thing, but what we are facing as a nation today, 2024, is an erosion of trust with the institution of policing as a whole across the board now. I'm not saying that your average conservative or your average liberal is doesn't trust cops. I'm saying from where we are today, from 20 or 30 years ago, well, when I was growing up as a kid, I never felt unsafe around a cop. I never felt any sort of way when I saw a cop. And I would say even POC did not feel any certain way around cops because in general, we could trust and assume correctly that they weren't gonna abuse their power, that they were gonna be respectful. And nowadays, that is simply not the case. There are cops brutalizing their fellow police officers because they fit a description after hours. There's police officers mistaking everything under the sun, mice, cell phones, 
chocolate bars for guns because it's in the hands of a black person. We're seeing too much failure, too many, too many bad apples in the bunch. And sure, we can even argue the statistics. For every bad cop, there's 10,000 good cops. We can argue that. But overall, the culture, right, and it goes back to the culture and the way they're trained and the way they comport themselves in society is of a dominating and aggressive force. That, that, I, and to your point with the New York City Police Department, they are the eighth largest standing military in the world. Now, now let me say that again. The New York City Police Department in the United States of America, a city's police department is the eighth largest standing military in the world. That's insane. Is is there's so much crime, so much craziness happening in New York City that we need the eighth largest standing military in the world to deal with it. And if that's the case, then maybe we need to reassess our society and our social demographics. But realistically, I um, there, there's statistics that back this up. In general, the average uh, officers per 10K population should be around 16.1. So if, if we're talking hundreds of thousands of cops, we need a, what did you say, 300,000? 850,000. 350,000, and I'm sorry for clapping. 850,000. 850,000. Across the country. Oh, yeah, sure. Oh, oh, okay, so that wasn't just New York City. You're right. Okay, so times 16. If we're going, that's how many left and resigned last year, right? Or last month? I missed the statistic because I thought you said uh, New York City. Either way, this amounts to a jurisdiction of 13 million people, right? That's more than the population of Ohio and several other states, and it's certainly more than the population of New York City. So do we have so much crime in our country that we need 850,000 cops? That's the first question. The second question is no, right? The second question is, if we don't need that many cops in the first place because there isn't that much crime to go around, then what are these cops doing? Most of them, most law enforcement, and this is, again, where the perception becomes a bigger problem, is most law enforcement's role is to collect fines from speeding tickets and traffic enforcement. And, and that it, it's, it's not fair. It, it's, it, it definitely degrades the, um, the profession to reduce it to that. But there are quotas, whether they're actually written or they're unwritten. People, uh, officers, I know officers, my dad's in corrections, I know police officers, and I know police officers who have been prevented from promotion because they didn't give out enough speeding tickets that month, that they didn't do enough of their job. But I think that I think that we got to look at something else. We have to look at what's going on in the nation as it relates to the crime rate in the nation and who is the greatest perpetrator of the crime and how are they as children raised to deal with the police? And what goes on in the black community in the black houses about what their children are instructed from very early age, what to do if they come in contact with a policeman. If you're in a car, the hands go on the wheel and they don't come off the wheel. There are certain things that you have to do in order to protect your life because there is a general fear in the black community to the police officer, whether they be white or black is irrelevant. So that there is a huge lack of trust in a community of 45 million people in this country. You're not how, I, how do you change that? Again, you can only change people's feelings, their emotions, right? If, like, like Roger said in the beginning, <laughs> we, we're, we're not gonna agree on, on possibly many issues. So what can we do, what can I do to convince you that even though we don't agree, right, that we aren't on board with the solution to the problem, if we can at least agree on the problem, right? So you have to appeal to wherever the, the center of ground is, right? The only way to build a bridge is for, you know, to, to start building and, and finding common ground to build it upon. And so the black community specifically in of course, it's Black History Month. The black community in America has every single justifiable historical reason to fear police. Uh, it, they just, they, they do. Historically, 
I don't I don't even know where to to begin. I mean, we can talk about Rodney King. We can talk about uh, George Floyd. We can talk about MLK. We can talk about the you know the fact that during segregation, police would beat nearly to death black people for using whites only uh, drinking fountains. I mean, this this history in our country is deep seated, and of course, the institution of policing uh, began from the slave patrol. I said. At the end of the day, our very institution, the very institution of law enforcement, stems from the slave patrol, which, for those who may or may not know, the slave patrol literally went and got runaway slaves, beat them, brought them back to the plantation where they were beaten some more, and then forced back to work. That was their job. That was their purpose. And after the Civil War, when slavery was ended, they turned into sheriffs who then turned those plantations into prison labor camps. And prison labor was founded. This isn't me or any liberal just scouting off the mouth. This is historical fact. So from the very, very, very beginning of policing and uh, institutionalized labor from uh, prisons, who was the labor? Black people. Let me, uh, I, I know we need to move on, but let's, let me ask you one straightforward sure. question. Go back to your your most where you just talked about the 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 slave catchers and the people like that. If you had to allay um, the Jim Crow laws and uh, slave catchers and all that, if you had to lay that at the feet of a political party, where would you put it? Democrat or Republican? Mm, I love that question. It's a very loaded question because. The parties have shifted over time. At that moment in history, it was the Democrats. You're 100% correct. Uh, because the Republican Party was the liberal party at the time. And the Democrats were the conservative party at the time. And then it switched during World War II. And it's currently switching before our very eyes again. Yes. So, so let's, let's move on happened. to another, another issue, if I could, uh, Roger. Uh, and that is his platform on taxation. Mm. Uh, we had a long discussion about this last week. Uh, he believes that if you make over four hundred thousand dollars, four hundred thousand and one dollars, that one dollar and anything above it should be taxed at ninety three percent. And he wants to eliminate billionaires. That's true. And if a business or an individual makes over a hundred thousand dollars, they their taxes rapidly increase. But is that a fair representation? No, that's a mixed representation. You were absolutely right about the billionaires. So the 400000 uh, that 93% tax rate, was during the Eisenhower administration. Uh, and it was 70% up until the Reagan administration. So I was giving historical context. I actually don't start taxing at those extremely high brackets until we get into the seven and eight figure range. Because we did have a very good discussion about how that $400,000 mark is essentially middle class now. Uh, it's not wealthy <laughs> by any stretch of the imagination. Back in the 1950s, $400,000 was the equivalent to $5.7 million. I, I uh, Googled that after we were done talking. Because you were right. I was like, man, that does seem excessive. But our current tax code, uh, the current tax code, does have the same brackets as it did back uh, during Eisenhower administration, which is anything over $400,000 currently, I believe, is 35%. So that $400,000 and $1 is uh, taxed at 35% all the way up to whatever, unless, of course, you can do write-offs such as like charitable donations like Taylor Swift and her $100 million or uh, what, Elon Musk and his $5.6 billion to his own charity so he could get a $4 billion write-off. Yeah. So... That's where the 400000 came in. I'm actually, and I'll, I'll pull it up real quick just so uh, we can all um, be on the same page here. Uh, on samrunner.com, you go to the taxes thing, and you pull it up, and I guess I don't have the tab open already. So anyway, I start taxing at 100000 So from $0 to 99999 0%. 0% income taxes at the federal level, right? 0% income taxes. Taxation starts at 10% at the 100,000 bracket, and then it goes to 200,000, which goes up to, I believe, 12%. And I have to, again, pull this up just to make sure um, that I'm not wrong about my own uh, policy here. Um, and then it goes up and it goes up. 
from there. So here it is, uh, samroner.com slash taxation dash economics. Uh, $100,000 to the 999 is 10%. 200,000 to 300,000 is 15%. 300 to 400 is 20%. So I'm actually lowering taxes uh, to 20% as it turns out. I'm dropping taxes 15% of where they currently are for that uh, $400,000 income level. From 400 to 500, it's 25%. From 500k to 1 million, just under 1 million, is 30%. So we're still cutting taxes for the well-off, the upper middle class. And then from 1 million to 10 million, we start bumping up to 40%. From 10 million to 100 million, nice big. Dollars, 75%. And then that billionth dollar, that penny, that ticks you over to a billion dollars and beyond is at 99%. And the reason, the reason why I just went through that nice long e explanation is the same reason why Eisenhower did it and the same reason why the father of capitalism himself, Adam Smith, stated a corporation's first responsibility is to his worker. His second responsibility is to his company. His third responsibility is to his community. And if you're going to hoard wealth, you're doing none of those things. And that was the point of the 94% during the Eisenhower administration. Remember, this is Ike. This is the five-star general of the armed forces who won World War II for America. He taxed us at 94% because he knew companies would then invest and give raises and pensions and benefits and go right back into the community. And that money would get distributed back into the country rather than hoarded into to some you know, bank vault somewhere. And nowadays, with the digital economy, I mean, it's so easy to move billions of dollars overseas to Cayman Islands, to hidden, you know, tax havens all across the world without ever having to take ownership of it. And that actually amounts to well over $3 trillion in lost revenues in the first place. So this removes that from a possibility of happening. It also ensures that reasonable incomes, I mean, not that, I mean, if you and I made a million dollars, I think we would be pretty stoked at the end of the day. But even a million dollars, I'm not taxing at egregious levels because that's barely wealthy anymore. When when the average home is like four hundred, six hundred thousand dollars across the country, what's a million dollars, right? Uh, do you see all these articles where even four hundred thousand dollars with a family of, of five, uh, husband, wife, three kids, vacation, mortgage, and all that. Like, they're still living paycheck to paycheck. Granted, not within their means, but that's neither here nor there. I don't start getting a a aggressive with the wealth taxes until we're looking at eight figures or more, nine figures, actually, uh, or more. Because that is when wealth hoarding starts to come into play. And that has detrimental impact. Less than 1% of the country controls over 90% of all wealth in our country. That's, that's not healthy. That's not sustainable. I mean, what thing, what, what thing do you know that 99.99% of the mass is sustained by the remaining 0.01% that is dealing with the rest of the population? It's impossible. It, that's why we keep having or getting these worst problems. It, it's just like blaming... Uh, these skyrocketing prices on inflation while corporations are bragging about record profits, but also then laying people off. They do not correlate. This tax solution, this tax reform, if you will, ensures that the burden of taxation goes to the moneyed classes instead of the working class, and that the working class then has the means and re responsibility and the resources to participate in the economy outright. Uh, without having to arbitrarily raise, raise wages. Because if you're not paying income taxes on $30,000, you're getting a full $30,000. You don't have to raise the minimum wage to $20 or $30 an hour. You just, you're not taxing it. So you actually have that money that you would be raising otherwise. And where does the money come from? Right now, again, this is, this is all Excel spreadsheets readily available on federal.gov uh, slash budget, I believe it is. These are all numbers you can find online easily. The current tax burden uh, of working class Americans averages out at around 
That's the yeah. Uh, let me ask well, one last question because we need to get IQ and Roger back in on this. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I just, well, what's, what, in your vision, what's the role of the IRS? Whew. So the short answer, because, right, we've been having our own conversation. Sorry, <laughs> Roger. Sorry, IQ. Um, the role of the IRS should be to focus on criminal tax activity and not aggressively harassing working class citizens for every red cent they have. Go after the actual white collar criminals who are just absolutely abusing our tax codes for their own personal gain. IQ? Al, you there? I'm listening because I'm learning. <laughs> yeah. And when I'm learning, I keep my mouth shut. <laughs> But if I'm not learning the right thing, I will interfere. No, it's fantastic. I love what you're saying. Uh, Everything you're saying is logical. The trouble is the government system in America has absolutely no logic. You're you not are, wrong. <laughs> I'm, I'm never wrong. With, uh, believe me, Samuel, I'm never wrong because I always back up everything. Dan is also rarely wrong. He will get you figures I've never seen in my life or heard in my life. But they're all correct. Hmm. The minute you can back up what you say, nobody can defeat you. It's impossible. It cannot be done. Because you can quote left from wherever you want. You can quote figures. <laughs> Knowledge, as you said, is power. It the is. trouble is you have very few people in America with knowledge. I always said and on this show, most American people are stupid. I'm not, I'm not calling them ignorant. They are stupid. They are not willing to learn. They are not willing. If he is in Ohama, oh, so if he is, let's say, Hawaii, he doesn't know much about Alaska. If he's in Alaska, he doesn't know much about New York. And most of them, they don't know anything about the Constitution. Look at the new generation of students you have. Mm -hmm. You don't have students. You have idiots. I want to... Chime in, and maybe the word that would be less incendiary is complacent. We are very, very complacent as a nation in that we do not care what's outside of our own little bubble. However big or small that bubble is, we do not care. Like you said, if I'm in Hawaii, I don't give a damn about Alaska. If I'm in Ohio, I don't give a damn about Florida. If uh, the Constitution doesn't impact me directly, then I don't really care. Right? That's, that is America currently, and you're right. It is a tragedy, and it's something that... You're, I mean, even running for president, I can say all I want about improving the economy and access to education, but you can lead a horse to water, right? Isn't that what I say? Sorry. Is that the ice cream truck? Hey, I'd, I'd like a, a dark chocolate. Uh, <laughs> <Robbie Rowe. laughs> Sam, I like you. You're a wonderful young man. But I, I am problematic with uh, a, a lot of your policies, and, and we're not really going to have time to get into hardly any of them. I want to circle back uh, sure. to what we said before about law enforcement. You, you really kind of shocked me a little bit. You said that um, there's not enough crime uh, for us to have 850,000 uh, police across the country, and that and that so they have to they're just around to give out. Sam. Uh, the United States is like the wild, wild west now. Would you like to walk through Times Square with me right now with, with me wearing a Trump hat? Yes or no? Seriously. And I'm not trying I to get the no hard problem. time. Sam, the police, they've been vilified for years. And, and pulling somebody over for a traffic stop now is not what it was 10 years ago. Now, if, if you're saying that, yes, they're acting defensively, when they, put, they damn well are acting defensively because now to pull somebody over, it's not like it used to be. It used to be you pulled somebody over, and once in a blue moon, somebody would give you a hard time. Now, they have to be very careful when they pull somebody over because there's a, good, it's, there's a reasonably decent chance they're armed and may even use it. So I, I was just really kind of surprised that that uh, that you think that there's no lawlessness and we don't need that many police. I would say this. Those who would say, and I'm not saying you specifically, I'm not saying anyone in particular, those who would say that we have so much crime that we need to be policed heavily in order to live in a free fair and open society. Let me ask you, 
at what point do we draw a line in saying that this is enough? Because we, again, have law enforcement in major cities whose numbers exceed that of sovereign nations military. We have police forces for one city that exceed the military strength, including budget, of many sovereign nations. Are we that detrimentally at war <laughs> socially and at home that we need that kind of influence, that we need that much policing? I don't think so. Secondly, uh, with the traffic tickets, why are we writing traffic tickets in the first place? Why are we enforcing speeding tickets? Why, if, if this is the concern, punitive measures never resolve social issues, right? You take an engineering approach. Like, for instance, um, whenever there's a roundabout, uh, traffic accidents and traffic jams are reduced by anywhere from 10 to 30 to 70 percent, depending on the location. So if the problem is speeding and if the problem is, you know, traffic control and monitoring and what have you, then wouldn't improving traffic in of itself, the, the actual infrastructure, be far more beneficial long term than having 15 or 20 cops every single mile or across a, a certain swath? <clears throat> Sam, forgive me. I really don't want to talk about traffic tickets. I don't want to talk about traffic and police with traffic. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about people getting shot, getting brutalized, getting hit in the head with bats, getting kicked in the groin, pregnant women getting punched in the stomach, people getting thrown onto tracks, and we have too many police? No, we have defanged our police by defunding our police and vilifying our police and... Uh, for years, they've been vilified. And OK, let, let's let's talk about some of the real issues as far as. As far as crimes, like who's committing the crimes? OK, so in the black communities, there's a disproportionate amount of crime committed by the blacks. Now, we're not going to go back to the Civil War and all. The, uh, let's just talk about this civilly, not okay. blaming. Uh, OK, but there's a reason for it. It's not the black people's fault. However, there is some blame to the fathers that have walked out of the families. Now, statistics prove that the black families that are fatherless have a very high rate of, of committing crime compared to the rest of the country. Uh, black Lives Matter, I see that you're a proponent of Black Lives Matter, and yet Black Lives Matter doesn't have an answer to the solution. They're pouring gas on the flames because Black Lives Matter doesn't believe in the nuclear family. They don't think we should bother. To, you know, oh yeah, it's too much of a hassle to be a father. So you know what? Let's just do away with that. We don't need the nuclear family. That's a big problem, Sam. Black Lives Matter is not a solution. They're part of the problem because what the black communities need is a nuclear family. They need a father, a mother, and children. And along comes Black Lives Matter, and, and they're they're not for that. They're against uh, families uh, all having a father. I think we have to, you know, we have to say it the way it is. And um, they, they have not been any help whatsoever. They, they're putting it in the opposite direction. We could, look, we're all Americans. We all used to have certain values. Everything is like a jagged edge now. But it, it always was based around family values. values. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with having family values? And, and, and why shouldn't the, the black families have the family values that we... I, I believe a lot of conservative black families, in fact, do. I believe, in fact, I think they have very religious values and Christian values, the black community. But I think a problem is this fatherhood thing. And I'm just appalled that that Black Lives Matter uh, makes it worse instead of better. And you're a proponent of that. So uh, go ahead. What's your what's your feeling about that? So the black on black criminal statistic, according to I'm not the talking about black, on black, I'm just talking about just, crime. the black criminal activity, shall we say, okay. um, of the total arrests made in shall we say just 2019 that's the that's the chart that i happen to find 
In 2019, there was a total of 6.8 million crimes, or I'm sorry, arrests, uh, 4.7 million of which were white people, 1.8 million of which were black or African American, uh, 164,000 American and Asian, and then so on and so forth down the statistics soon or less. Mm -hmm. So fundamentally, white people are committing the most crimes in this country, and we allegedly don't have the nuclear family problem, yada, 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 right? What causes people to commit crimes, especially violent crimes, poverty, lack of resources. And again, historically, today, let's not even go historically, today, a black person with a 600 credit score and me with a 600 credit score will walk into a bank and say, hi, um, and let's just say arbitrary numbers, he makes $100,000, I make $100,000 a year, we both have a 600 credit score, we both uh, say, hey, I want to know what I can get for a home loan and an interest rate. We're both going to get, again, arbitrary numbers, $350,000 uh, for our loan. But I'm going to get 6% interest rate, and that guy is going to get 9%. Well, you could tell that story, Sam, but Bank of America is coming out with a policy where, where minority groups don't have to pay any down payment on their homes to get a mortgage. So and if, you know, if you they have to pay an extra three percent over the course of thirty years, that's two hundred thousand dollars. I mean, that's that's not doing anybody any favors. The second thing is taking home appraisals, generational wealth. Every time a black community has ever thrived in this country, it has been destroyed. That that is a, again historical fact. Tulsa, Oklahoma, the Tulsa massacre, the bombings, where law enforcement bombed this community into non-existence. Uh, we forget that. Um, Times Square or the, the major garden in New York City. I'm sorry, I don't remember the, the name quite right. That used to be a thriving black community and it just got wiped out and turned into a park. So then every time black people do try to get their homes appraised and they have all their black family and the pictures and the frames and whatever else have you, they get appraised less than if they literally get their friends, their white friends to get their pictures and show up to the appraiser and get their house appraised at the actual rate that it should be appraised at. So when we're talking about criminal activity, even for the affluent and successful black American citizen, it is significantly institutionally more difficult for them to achieve the same standards that white people get to enjoy without any of the work or labor or effort put into it, right? So now you take the poverty into to account. A poor white person and a poor black person. Poor white person in a trailer park. I'm talking methed out mother and father. I'm talking uh, cousins and brothers and sisters in and out of prison. I'm talking prostitution. I'm talking the whole gambit. Black person growing up in Harlem, New York. Uh, enough said. This child is going to be harassed by police. This child is not. This child is going to be threatened every single day of their growing up and treated with disdain and fear and aggression by every single law enforcement officer that they encounter because they grew up poor in a poor community. This white person is not simply due to the, the color of their skin. So this person, is, now we're graduating, we're 18 years old, we're, we're graduating high school. Let's say they got their shit together. Magna summa cum laude, magna summa cum laude, grew up in the hood, grew up in the trailer park, all sorts of juvie records, all sorts of juvie records. This child, this white child, can get a job. This black child cannot. So they're like, okay, well, uh, shucks. What if we just enlisted? Because we're friends. Like, let's, let's go into the army together. It's until, with poverty, until you can get into something like the military, that you finally get a, a modicum of equality and equal treatment in the society. Poverty exists. It's institutional racism and discrimination exists in this country. I, we can spend days talking about it. There's a long myriad history, and it is happening to this very day. So you want to talk about black crime. It, we have a word for a forced impoverization of these communities. It's called gentrification. You, you, you put in a new cafe, 
uh, charge five dollars a cup for coffee, and uh, you put another, you know, brewery, homemade, whatever thing. All of a sudden, the housing values start skyrocketing. People are getting pushed out of their homes because they can't afford them anymore because of the uh, the rising cost of living. And what are, what are these people going to do? They have to now move to more squalid conditions. They have to move to more destitute conditions so that they can even survive. And what happens when people become desperate and put into survival mode, black, white, or otherwise? They go into survival mode. They fight. They become aggressive. And the whole concept of um, this is just the way that it is and you know, maybe if their fathers weren't, their fathers were arrested for crack cocaine in the 80s when they never had crack cocaine. The the punitive the punitive measure, the actual criminal regulation for uh, uh, allocating um, jail time for possession of cocaine, typically a predominantly white person drug, versus crack. Crack is higher by five years. We. You want to talk about black crime, a lot of crime that exists, that is results in arrests, and we can we can disregard the aggression. I mean, if you're shooting somebody, I don't give a damn what your race is, but if we even include nonviolent crime, first offender, first offender, slap on the wrist, jail time. It, 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 it never, it never go, very rarely, Will a first-time black offender not get something thrown at them? Very rarely. In our criminal justice system, does that happen? So, again, if you want to talk about the statistics, you've got to include the institutional racism and the institutional discrimination and the disproportionate amount of criminal punitive uh, action taken against POC versus white people. If you're not having that conversation, you're only having half of the conversation. Roger, well, I've got about, about five minutes. Can I respond to what, uh, sure. what he said? Um, I listened, this is the second time I've listened, and I, I, I would, I would want to follow what Roger was saying. Um, the population, the percentage of the population in this country that's white is the largest single population in the country, about 60%. Mm -hmm. When you look at crime statistics, you look at the percentage of the population that, can, that commits the crime. The black community can, does as considerably higher crime as a percentage of their population based on a statistic of how many crimes per 100,000 people in the population. The population. Than, the, than white or Hispanics or others. Now, rather, Roger has a point about the absence of fathers leading their, their, their families. But I, I, I believe that you, what you were just saying about housing discrimination, you have uh, an effective, effectively condemned the Democratic Party because it was the Democratic Party who supposedly did away with redlining and all these other issues that affected the ability of minorities, including blacks, to get into housing. So the Democratic Party is the party that's responsible for the number of crimes and the lack of housing and, and drugs. It all falls on the backs of the, the Democratic Party, yet nobody says that. Um, um, I'm, also I'm also concerned that uh, when we look at crime, we need to look at violent crime. I do not know, and I have asked many a black person, politician, civic leader, reverend in the city of Chicago, why is it the murder capital of the country and why are children being murdered on weekends to this tune of much more so than any other part of the country? And it's been going on for decades and the Democratic Party, which has control of the city of Chicago, appears to be doing nothing about stopping the genocide, the genocide that's, taking that's taking place, place in, the, in, the, in the, the black community. It's as if the Democrats plain don't care. So I think that what's important is we have to look at the source that's created all these issues. And the source has been the leadership and the political philosophy 
of the Democratic Party, not the Republican Party. I never what? said anything about partisanship. I said we have institutional racism and systemic racism in our country. And I, I, I think you can say that, but you have to say that it's primarily from Democrats as opposed to Republicans. And I'm happy to say that. I am not afraid to say that. Sam, if I, I got to just add to that. Look, the country has come quite a ways from the Civil War. Hmm. And are you aware that the police chiefs and mayors of cities across the country are many, many of them are black? Are you not aware of that? The city employees across the country are now in the hands of, of of the black communities, and so it's it's. Uh, let me ask you. Well, I know we're running out of time. We could talk for hours and hours, and I could oh, see my damn for yeah. an hour and a half. But one, I saw one of your posts, and I like you, but I, I really don't like your policies. <laughs> but you, I like. And uh, but Daniel Penny, why do you call him a vigilante when he was a good Samaritan? He was protecting people on that train, on that rail. I thought it, I thought it was your post. You're looking. Uh-huh. Uh, you familiar with what I'm saying? That was you, wasn't it? Let me double check. You said Daniel Penny. I'm sorry, Daniel Penny was the uh, the white guy. I I don't I, I think he might have been a veteran, but and he, yes, he was, as a matter of fact. And he was on a subway car, and there was a a, a black man that was doing Michael Jackson. Th- but in any case, he started harassing and intimidating uh, people on the subway car, and. Daniel Penny came Penny to their aid. No, if you're not familiar with it, forget it. Let's move on. That's. But I, I went on the site and I saw there was one of your one of your posts regarding that, and you basically called him a, a vigilante. So that's what I was asking you why. No, I I now that I see the article again, you're right. Um, I do call him a vigilante. Uh, so there were several incidents when I was in the Air Force of airmen, uh, even overseas and and uh, like the Spanish trains. Uh, they actually, there was like a group of three that uh, actually subdued a, I believe, an actual terrorist threat. Uh, I think they that that individual that those three airmen subdued was an actual uh, attempted terrorist, like a, a, engaging in something. They didn't kill him. This guy did. This guy did kill this. Uh, re- it says right here, court documents say that Penny approached Neely from behind and put him into a chokehold, which he kept in place. For several minutes, including after Neely's body stopped moving. If you're an amateur, then you shouldn't be doing this in the first place, which uh, vigilantism, by definition, is take is uh, a non-appointed officer of the law taking the law into their own hands, right? There's such thing as citizen's arrest, and had he done that, no problem. But he put him in a chokehold and killed the guy. Well, he essentially was making a citizen's arrest. I don't know what might have been in the young man's body. I don't remember all the details of it. But I think if you would if you interview the people on that train car, they were all grateful. I mean, what if it was your sister or daughter or mother on that train car? So this is to your point. Um, this article isn't going into great detail of this situation. Right. So I, I don't remember. How, I don't even remember when this happened. Um, <laughs> That's OK, Sam. But you're a good I, I'm just saying. Uh, let me let me put it this way. Yeah. When if you're trained and you kill somebody doing things that you are trained to do, then you are at fault because you should know better. You should have use of force training. You should know, you know that that okay, they're asleep, let go. Mm-hmm. Uh, make sure that they're still conscious, make sure they're still a pulse. It's not to this is not a tangent, this isn't to go back on that, but it, it goes back to the reason why. When that officer killed George Floyd, it was because he was kneeling on his neck for 10 minutes. Had he just arrested George Floyd and then knelt for backup, I guess, which he didn't need because there was backup right there, right? The context is this officer had training in how to subdue a uh, suspect, succeeded in subduing said suspect, had him arrested, had him handcuffed by his back, had him in the prone position, and then proceeded to do something that he knew through his training would result in a negative consequence. My understanding of this at the time and currently is that Daniel was acting out of line. He went too far and he he should have known better. That's all I'm saying on that, that it, to, to put it in context. All right, Sam, we don't we don't have to agree, but I, I appreciate that you're a sport. Look, we're going to begin to wrap up. So, sure. Sam, where can the folks go to hear more of you and see your platform, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah. Um, so 
my website is samronin.com, uh, and my social media is sam4, the number four, president2024. Um, you can find me all over the place. Please, I love getting into these uh, conversations. I think they're healthy. I think they're important. I don't think we can have discourse anymore where we're talking about difficult issues. This was a very difficult conversation, but we all kept our cool. We all we all got our points across, and I think now the audience has a, a, an ability to understand where we're all coming from. And that's all I'm trying to do. I'm not saying I'm right. I'm not saying I'm wrong. I'm saying these are the ways I would approach the issues as I see them. If you have better ideas, I'd love to hear them. No, and it's great that you know you're willing uh, to uh, to just speak out. There are so many issues, Dan and IQ. Right? We really hardly scratched on anything. We need we need another interview. Well, <laughs> uh, really, we could go through so much stuff. But for now, Sam, I'm going to thank you for being on the show. Uh, you're a good sport. You're a fine young man, and I wish you uh, all the success in life. Um, IQ, always great to have you on board. Thank Mr. you, Dan Perkins. Uh, this is the Jiggy Jaguar Show. Roger Hope.